Hey, guys, we're good to get started now. Okay, great. great. All right. Well, um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Sarah Bailey. I am an Australian author. My most recent book is uh, the standalone thriller The Housemate. Uh, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend this to any First Nations people watching today. Uh, as part of Booktoberfest, Booktopia's annual festival of the best new books, which runs throughout October, I'm thrilled to be joined today by Chris Hammer, author of many, many books, but most recently, The Tilt. Hello, Chris. Good morning. <laughs> Hi there, Sarah, and hello, everyone, and, and it's great to be part of the um, Booktoberfest. Absolutely. Now, um, for everybody listening, please feel free to show all of your support and let us know via a little emoji reaction if you have ordered Chris's latest book, The Tilt. If you haven't, you can get a copy of our books right now from booktopia.com.au. So, Chris, I am very excited to speak uh, with you today. Now, I do know a little bit about your background, but just for those who don't, um, might be worth starting off with uh, the past, which is that you were a journo turned author. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and sort of how that came about? Yeah, I was a journalist for about 30 years, um, concentrating uh, mainly on federal politics in the press gallery in Canberra, but also I had two long stints as a roving foreign correspondent. I did have the opportunity, oh, it's about 12 years ago, to write some non-fiction books, and I absolutely loved it, but um, I couldn't make a living out of it. I had to go back to work, get a real job again. Uh, but in the meantime, I missed writing, so I started writing the book uh, that became Scrublands, my, my first crime thriller, um, almost as a hobby project with a little bit more serious attitude than that and lo and behold all this all the stars came into alignment because i got sacked i lost my job <laughs> but but just right about then uh, i had a meteoric career as a political advisor it lasted about three weeks then i quit because i got this fantastic book deal and now i'm a full-time writer so the tilt is my fifth crime book there was scrublands silver and trust which is part of the kind of Martin Scarsden Mandalay Blonde series. And now we've had Treasure and Dirt and The Tilt, which feature two uh, New South Wales homicide detectives, Ivan Lukic and Nell Buchanan. Yeah, and I, I was actually sort of going to say to you, um, because I've obviously written a series and then flipped to a standalone, uh, you did flip to a standalone, but then you've turned that into a series. So was that something that was planned or did you initially intend for that just to be a one-off story and it sort of evolved from there? I absolutely did intend it to be a standalone. I thought I really like Martin and, and Mandy so I thought but I'm going to give them a break and I'm going to write a standalone. I had an idea that I thought might work but a little better with, with different characters but exactly the same thing happened with Treasure and Dirt that happened with Scrublands because Scrublands I intended to be a standalone. I mean, I was just trying to write a book. You know, it'd be silly to be yeah. thinking of a series at that stage. But it was the characters that got under my skin. I thought, these people are interesting. They've got more to tell. And that's what happened with Treasure and Dirt. So the tilt takes Ivan and Nell, and particularly Nell, forward uh, in, into another, not just another crime investigation, but another sort of emotionally fraught um, journey. And I suppose once you create a world, even if it is just initially for a standalone, that world can sort of take on a life of its own and it starts to sort of um, expand before your very eyes. I'm assuming that's kind of how the ideas start to get ahead of the story you're currently writing. That's right. Um, and that, that idea of creating a world is very important to me, even though the books are set in contemporary Australia so it's kind of real world it's not fantasy or sci-fi or historical fiction or anything like that I really like as a reader that kind of immersive book where you sink yourself into it you leave your daily troubles behind and you enter the world of the book um, and what's happened there with my characters they've grown so even though Treasure and Dirt 
and uh, The Tilt are a new series. There's many sort of recurring characters mm. from the previous books. So, for example, um, Ivan Lukic, who's a, who's a prominent character in these two books, was a very minor character in the first three. Martin Scarson was, a, was, you know, the protagonist in the first three, really. But he has a bit of a cameo in Treasure and Dirt. And again, in the tilt, not, not for the sake of it, it's not gratuitous. It's because the plot needs some contact with a journalist. So why not use a journalist we kind of know and love? Yeah, I kind of I love the idea um, of you being sort of author and um, almost like orchestra leader and you're sort of able to then dip in and, and recognise a little part of the story that actually might need to take centre stage um, at a certain point in time and then they might sort of dip down and become a minor character again. It's sort of that really nice um, cadence of kind of character that shines through. It's really interesting. Yeah, what about you? Do, you? do you find that with your your um, Gemma Woodcock stories that you like the recurring characters, not just the main character? Yeah, I d- definitely. I mean, I think it's similar to when, when actors talk about playing a character role versus the lead. You know, I think the lead shoulders the majority of the emotional sort of, you know, toll of the story and it's obviously the perspective that the, the reader or the viewer is sort of following most closely. But it's often those character um, roles that really provide like whether it's the comic relief or the emotional punch or um, they've just got a really distinctive component to their personality that, you know, drives the light and shade of the story. So, yeah, I often end up sort of liking my my sub-characters as much if not more than the main characters and I think that's when there starts to be a temptation to sort of give them their own specific story to, to sort of own and lead. So, yeah, I definitely think that that's a common, a common element of sort of crafting and thinking about future ideas. Yeah, I, I find, you know, sometimes with minor characters, they're just in there because the plot needs your main character to learn something. But so they're there. I try and make them interesting, maybe funny or eccentric or threatening, whatever Mm. it is. Mm. But then later on as I'm writing, I think, oh, I don't need a new character. I can bring that one back. And sometimes the the ones that start as minor characters actually start playing a really important role in the book. So in Scrublands, Codger Harris is like that. Yes. And in Treasure and Dirt, I start the book with these opal thieves going down an opal mine they call Ratters. And it's a very dramatic opening. And I just thought, well, that's it. But later on in the book, it made sense to actually bring one of those Ratters up because, they had, you know, they knew stuff. And by the end of the book, you, you've got their whole backstory and why they're stealing opals and all of that. It's a kind of, I don't know, I, I find that strangely rewarding. What, what about you? Yeah, I think I I definitely have minor characters that I think have got a really sort of specific role to play and then as they evolve, it turns out that they've actually got, you know, a really key role to play and or maybe are more layered and important characters than I initially intended them to be. They can kind of surprise surprise you, I think, and end up, you know, playing a really, yeah, important role in the story and they're often... Um, they're often the characters that actually draw out more about your main characters. They sort of have that reflective quality where they kind of bounce off each other and it ends up being the best way that you can explain the main character's motivations by sort of how they interact with, with their minor kind of characters in the story. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that kind of management of a cast and the yeah. lead versus the, the sort of sub pieces in the, in the puzzle. That, that's really well observed. The, the big problem, of course, comes if you have a character that you actually like, and then you know you have to kill them. <laughs> oh, I've, look, we've all we've all been there, right? Definitely. I know. It's, and it's, funny. Kind of, it's a bit sad, and then you've got to remind yourself, you know, they're not real people; they're just characters in a book. Yeah, and also too, like there's there's genuine regret because you sort of think, oh, what a waste! Like that character would be perfect to do this other story or this other idea and now I you know I've disposed of them so now I can't use them ever again so yeah it's you've got to be very careful with who you exit stage left I think um 
So, all right, I want to just quickly dive, um, well, mini dive into The Tilt. Um, it is your fifth book, second in um, the series that is all about Ivan and, and Nell. So do you want to just give us a quick sort of 60-second pitch for The Tilt and what it's all about, including what is The Tilt and where was that name inspired from? So the book is set set in a real place, the Barma Millowa Forest, largest river red gum forest in the world, on the Murray River. And it's formed when the Murray floods because the Murray is partially dammed by an uplift of land that's called the Cadell Tilt. And what happens is a body is found in that forest. Nell and I are sent to investigate, but Nell's not too keen because, one, she's pretty sure this the remains are decades old, so there's no way they can solve the case. Um, but the second thing is she grew up in that area and her parents still live there and they have a very fraught relationship. So she's there. Then more bodies are discovered and Nell finds herself threatened and actually experiences violence. But the real clincher and the thing I think that will resonate with readers is as her investigation goes along, she begins to suspect that members of her own family are implicated in the murders. Yeah, I love, I mean, all of your stories, I think, have this. And I personally think it's the key to a really good crime novel in particular. But that sort of merging of the professional and the personal, I think, always makes the stakes so high for the character and it really blurs and complicates their ability to be objective, which is also a really good thing for someone that's supposed to be very, you know, morally um, have a lot of integrity. So I think it's always a great conundrum to sort of force them into, and I think The Tilt does that, you know, so well for, um, for, for Nell in particular, the lead character. Yeah, I think there's kind of two types of, you know, if you're writing crime series, there kind of, there's kind of two types of, detectives there's the ones that are kind of almost like a fantasy figure that are you know the Sherlock Holmes who's so brilliant or the Jack Reacher who's kind of indestructible or Mm. you know um, Miss Marple who's unflappable and is always you know underestimated but always comes out on top and then you get the other kind of detective which I guess kind of goes back to those hard-boiled detectives, you know, the Philip Marlowe type guys with a with trench coat and the tough exterior and all of that, but, but a bit more complex underneath. Yeah. So I'm just drawn to those stories. I think maybe you are too, where, yeah, the, 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 um, the protagonist the investigator really has a kind of emotional skin in the game. Yeah, I just think it, it does make for a more gripping story and it means that every decision kind of has that layered emotional punch uh, and yeah. they're sort of having to really question themselves at all times, question their their integrity, question their ability to think clearly. Um, there's obviously sometimes almost questions around their own sort of history and identity that can kind of come up sometimes. So I think, yeah, I totally agree with you. There's that that really fantasy detective, which, to be honest, I've never quite managed to write properly. I'm much more into the flawed um, sort of hero where they really have to sort of think about what good and bad means and how they kind of how they kind of navigate the line, you know, on a day-to-day basis when they've got things that are happening around them that they do have to kind of really make a decision around their own moral compass, I think. One... Um... One question I'd like to ask you, because I think it's mm. relevant to, to both our most recent books, you know, The Housemaid yeah. and, for me, The Tilt, is often, you know, in a crime book, and it's certainly here in, in our two books, you have a crime in the present day, but it harks back to events that have happened years before. Um, you know, it's almost like a chain of events have been set in motion so it might be years, it might even be decades before. Yes. And, and, and the crime in the present is kind of like a consequence of what's happened in the past. H- how do you go about revealing all of that to the reader? <laughs> yeah, well, as, as you would know, it can be 
really challenging. And I, I was going to say to you as well, like I think with the tilt, it's so ambitious in its scope of managing, you know, multiple timelines, not just two but sort of many. Um, and that, that feeling that things that have happened in the past you can never quite escape from, you know, they're always going to come back to bite you or somebody else, um, I think is a really interesting theme to explore. Um, and, yeah, definitely in The Housemate, you know, there's sort of 10 years between the two, the two key crimes. It essentially means that in the present version of the story, it's a cold case that sort of hots up again because there's a new development in that, in that, in that case that's kind of gone quiet. Everyone's catapulted right back to the emotions that they were feeling at that time. And I think that gives you a lot to play with from a character point of view. It really allows you to dig into, you know, guilt and shame and responsibility and what someone's decisions in the past, you know, are they the same person? Have they changed? Like I think it just gives you an amazing sort of platform on which to really explore and have that character both kind of self-reflect and make decisions around, you know, will they behave differently this time around? Are they a better person than they used to be? Or even like are they a better person than other people were back then? So I think it's sort of um, as opposed to a crime that happens cold where you can sort of, I guess, come at something quite fresh and there's a clean slate, it's murkier when there's a, a crime in the past that's being referenced because you sort of have potentially the opportunity to right some wrongs uh, and I guess you can decide as a character, you know, if you're going to do that or not. So you get to sort of play with all of those really complicated emotions. Yeah, it automatically gives your the characters, um, it makes them more rounded and nuanced and with greater depth because, you know, with any character, you're trying to work out their backstory. But if they've been involved in a crime, you know, in in the past, like years or decades before, that affects their character, it shapes their character. So they're already, in a way, semi-formed when you start writing them. Yeah, exactly, exactly, which I think is a really good segue into just sort of more broadly talking about crime books and crime fiction before we get back into specifically writing The Tilt and how you found yeah. that. So, I mean, I think, you know, we've talked about you were a journo, you flipped to fiction, um, you initially did write some other novels that weren't in the crime fiction genre, but this feels like the, the genre that you've really settled into. Um, how did that kind of come about and where where do you kind of get your ideas from, particularly for those first books in the series? <laughs> I, um, <laughs> yes, I, I did try and write a novel when I was in about my 20s and it was, you know, it's one of those books that's in the bottom drawer it's in the bottom drawer for a good reason because it's <laughs> absolutely atrocious. I mean, embarrassingly bad. Um, <laughs> fortunately for me, um, that's not a major confession because so many writers will tell you the same thing. They didn't just write a good novel straight up. They had they had a few trial runs. Then I wrote the non-fiction books and they were uh, kind of like travel writing. They call it narrative nonfiction. So it's not just a recitation of facts or an essay or something like that. You can you can use more colourful language. You, you, as I say, you can be impressionistic. I like that. I, I didn't, um, as I said, I couldn't make any money, had to get a job. But mm -hmm. I missed the writing and I thought I'd try fiction. Now, my kind of go-to reading at that point would have just been I guess more literary fiction, not the not not the classics, but you know the book of the of the year, you know, or the book of the month, the the sort of the ones that are hitting the zeitgeist. Yeah. But I just didn't think I was a good enough writer, and I didn't have the idea. But I thought if I did a crime book, well, that would give me the skeleton, and if I can get a good plot, then maybe the rest will follow. I'd read um, you know, I'd read a bit of crime and liked it. I really liked that old, um, the Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, you know, the tough guy, hard-boiled detective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the ones that star Humphrey Bogart when they were made in the films. Um, and there was a few others like Michael Connolly. But the big one for me was a guy called Peter Temple um, who wrote the Jack Irish books, um, was the first Australian to win the um, UK crime writer's gold dagger. Um, and his last book, Truth, won the Miles Franklin Award, the most 
prestigious literary award in Australia. Really unusual for a genre book to win an award like that. But I knew Peter because he was my writing teacher when I was doing journalism, uh, back before he'd written any fiction. And I'd seen what he could do with a crime book and I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to give, give that a crack. I won't be as good as him, but maybe if I can get a good plot together, maybe I can write something halfway decent. Well, I think it's kind of lucky for all of us that you, that you gave it a red-hot go because it's obviously turned out to be, um, to be a happy place. Um, and in terms of that word, happy place, I, I was going to sort of ask you, like I, I always get asked if I find writing crime you know, tough or challenging kind of from an emotional perspective, I feel like, um, not that I want to answer the question for you, but your books, while they are dark and grim and they, you know, cover some really serious sort of situations and obviously there is death and murder and all of that type of stuff in there, there's enough light in your books and I guess a real focus on character that it doesn't feel as heavy as I think it, it might with some other crime books do you do you find that when you write them it's more enjoyable than kind of emotionally taxing yeah I'm, I, although I like reading books that are you know crime books that are quite gritty I think you're right about mine there's a bit more light and shade there's often not just uh, justice delivered at the end of the books which is common of course mm. in many crime books some there's a you know there might be a sense of redemption for the characters so the ending may in some way, so, so as you and I were saying, it's good when the characters have emotional skin in the game, you know, that yeah. their, their heart is, the, is on their sleeve. And so if they work through and not only solve the crime, but somehow resolve the, these emotional challenges, it doesn't matter if, if some elements of the book have been quite, say, confronting all this violence, by the end, it's, you know, possibly feels a bit uplifting for the reader because, you know, our characters have kind of made it through and have learnt something, have grown, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, maybe it's that sense of redemption. Also, I think in writing it, I just, uh, you know, you can write a psychological thriller that just the tension just ratchets up and up and up and up. Mm. And those books are great. But I'm not, I, I think my books are probably a bit more light and shade. So if you have a scene that's not, you know, it's just a transactional scene, the protagonist meets someone who tells them something, you know, to try and ramp it up and artificially sort of ratchet up the tension, you know, it's just going to fall a bit flat. I, you know, some writers can do it, I can't. And so I think, well, why not, why not give it another complexion? And sometimes that complexion might be a humorous one. And I think the effect then is if you have a, it gives you a little bit of a breather before between dramatic scenes. And so that will tend by contrast to make the next dramatic scene all seem all the more dramatic. So I think it's it's not so much a, a deliberate strategy, it's just it's just a style that I think think I do sort of almost subliminally. Yeah. I mean I, I kind of look at your books and I think particularly this one, they're sort of like puzzle circles. And I think because they're such great mysteries and they're quite complex with all of these different threads that need to be um, both sort of set up, pulled, like analysed and then resolved, even when the content is dark and, and there is, you know, a lot of genuine emotion that the characters are going through, I think you're mentally stimulated enough as a reader that the puzzle and the resolution and kind of how, what, when, why, you're not getting too sucked into sort of just, you know, sadness or, or whatever. It's kind of it, it's enough of a puzzle that that's really what's driving you forward and then there's such satisfaction at the end. Yeah, so the, the trick for me is you want, you want all the elements to be as good as possible, the plot, the setting, the characters, the pace of the book, the voice, the language, and if you can get them all working together instead of say against each other, mm. um, you know that the the, the the wish is um, or the aspiration is that then 
the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. Yes. That the characters reinforce the setting, the setting reinforces the plot, the plot reinforces the characters and around in the circle. Yes. And that you as the writer ma- manage to pace the story properly. So so it's, it, you know, it compels the reader to turn the page, I guess. Yeah, you're back to being that orchestra conductor and, and just yeah. really carefully managing all of those different instruments and sort of crescendos and quietest moments, all that, all of those tricky things yeah. to, to get right. And, um, and when, when yeah. you write, are you really deliberate about that or is it just, <laughs> or are you just trying to get the story out the best you can? I think it's, all, it's a funny kind of question because I don't think when you're writing the, the first draft in particular, you can be too deliberate. I sort of feel like a lot of it is just instinct and getting the plot points down and getting those characters sort of as shaped as possible. But I think when you do the editing process, you're a little bit, well, personally, I'm a bit more strategic at that point. I'm able to step back, look at the story and sort of identify where I think there's weak pieces of the puzzle, where things don't quite line up. So I think the first draft for me is is pretty much just a download and, and I write it really quite quickly um, and then you're able to sort of go in and, and really manipulate the, the various moments and hopefully get to a place where, you know, you've got a really good sort of puzzle and story coming to life. Yeah, I, um, I, I think I'm pretty similar to you in that. I heard someone say once, um, write with your heart and edit with your head. Yeah. And that's, and that's what I do for sure. Yeah. And I think like once you've written sort of more than one book, I think you try to get the head part happening earlier than than you perhaps previously did and I think that can actually get a bit, it's a bit of a trap in a way, I think, if you're trying to kind of really strictly edit as you go in that first draft, I think you can almost trip yourself up and get in your own way a little bit so that becomes something to kind of keep at bay. <laughs> so, so, so I know some writers have a really set kind of method mm. Um how about you? You're like four books in now, so four or five. Yeah, I've written I've written four novels, and then I've got yeah. an audio an audio story oh, as yeah. well, and so I'm cu- currently writing the fifth novel. And does your met- has your methodology stayed the same in the way you write? Or have you changed over time? I think it's actually pretty similar. I think mm. it's sort of I don't seem to be able to become a more organised writer. Try as I would like um I would really like to be someone that could plot the whole story out and then really have this lovely organized sort of filling in the gaps approach but it it does seem that that right with your heart is really my only way to get a first draft sort of onto the page um so yeah that that's really kind of still how I approach it I think perhaps I'm a little bit more mindful of tidying things up as I go which like I said I think can be both good and bad um, but I kind of almost can't help myself now I, I think I used to ignore parts of the manuscript that I knew were weak and I'd sort of hope that no one else would notice them whereas yeah. now I'm a little bit more like I know that this needs to be fixed may as well fix it now or may as well at least give it a give it a sort of shot and fix it as much as I can now and then really nut it out in the edit so I'm perhaps a bit harder on myself and I don't let things through to the keeper as much as I used to. Um, but I think broadly it's it's pretty similar. What about you? Because I, I was going to ask you, you know, as I said before, I think The Tilt is such an ambitious book because not only do you have the normal, you know, madness of trying to work out a mystery, all the different threads, subplots, characters, but you've also got these multiple timelines that you're managing and kind of a different... Um, a different writing style for each timeline that, we, that you're sort of bringing to the audience. Did you find it more difficult to write because of that or and, and why did you sort of decide to do something a little bit different for this book? Okay, so let me explain. In uh, The Tilt there are three different timelines with three different point of view characters. The first is an 11-year-old boy, boy called Jimmy and he's been tasked with taking the family's cattle into the Barma Millawa forest over summer and camping with them because there is a really severe drought on. Uh, this is during the Second World War and it's historically accurate. There was a terrible drought then. 
so there's this boy in the in the nineteen forties. Then there's a teenage girl. She lives um, her in a farm on the tilt above the forest, and um, her the forest for her is, is quite different. It's a place where the teenagers can escape to. And then there's Neil Buchanan in the present day. Now, and the stories at first seem to be completely, you know, separate. But as the book goes on, it's almost like their storylines cross over, that their their fates collide in that the things that have happened back in the 1940s and 1970s, you know, the, the ramifications of that are still being felt today. So the reason I did it was... When I wrote Treasure and Dirt, there's, as well as a present-day crime there, there's another crime from about seven years before and another one from about 20 years before. And by the end of the book, Nell and Ivan find out all about them, but they rely on people telling them stuff, uh, and that's how they find out, that's how the reader finds out. Um, But there's an old saying in writing... uh, you should show, not tell. And so Ivan and Nell were being, you know, they couldn't get in a time machine, so they were being told. So I thought what I'll try and do in the tilt is if there's events in the past, I'll try and tell them in the past. So, yeah, there's these three timelines in the woven. Um, So I I think it works well, but the question is a good one because it's tricky because you don't, you can't have the reader in any one of the timelines getting ahead of the other timelines. So mm. you can't be learning a whole lot of stuff uh, that Nell, for example, investigating the present, isn't aware of. And so you might have two two of the three stories rollicking along and then the danger is maybe the third story that they have to sort of run on the spot for a bit. For, for, yeah. you know, for the others to catch up and you don't want that. You want the really, in any crime book, you want the pace to be good, to, to you know, to be compelling, to turn the page. Well, with this, you kind of need to do that across three timelines. So getting them working, you know, together, you know, just you know, like an orchestra, the three different pieces playing, you know, in the same, you know, pace and whatever. Yeah, that was pretty tricky, and I, in some ways, I think I just fluked it. <laughs> that there was, there was, and and even, even very late in the day, um, I rewrote Nell's entire storyline, which is probably close to half the book. Um, didn't mean I just threw it out and started again, but there, but I was adding bits and changing the pace of it a bit to match the other two. So, yeah, it, it is a bit – I mean, I think when it works, it can work so well, but mm. it's it's maybe not the easiest thing to do. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure glad I tried it. I'm, you know, I'm, I might try it again, but I'm not – maybe not in my next book. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it does seem hard and I, I loved it. I, I sort of was definitely surprised initially. I was like, oh, this is really different for, for Chris and a different structure and approach, but – I loved the three unfolding stories and I actually, I think what you said before is so true, that um, really careful management of information reveal in each of those three timelines because they were all so linked to each other. It felt like this, you know, delicious kind of puzzle that was unfolding and because you kept then flipping back and forth between the different timelines, you were sort of almost creating this sense of um, impatience, but impatience in a good way because you'd be like, oh, I just want to know what happens in that, you know, that time. And then yep. you'd sort of be flipped back to the present and then you'd have to kind of wait to go back and find out. So I think it added a, a really fun layer of sort of discovery for the for the reader. Um, Chris, I was just going to ask you, this is just a quick kind of pure writing question. Paint a picture for us. When you were writing The Tilt, what else was going on in your life? Were you promoting another book? What, what, what was kind of your writing um, time like day to day? Where were you writing? How much writing were you doing every day? Talk us through the life of um, Chris Hammer in terms of writing The Tilt. Well, I, wa- I wasn't promoting another book in the sense that 
it was COVID and we couldn't tour. So I'm currently on a book tour that a publicist has been planning for three years. It's been canceled <laughs> for the last two years. Yeah. So in some ways, I guess that gave me more time to write. Mm-hmm. I love writing anyway. I, I, I like writing on trains and planes and airports and in cafes. I think maybe it harks back to my time as a, as a journalist, particularly when I was filing a lot from overseas. You'd be writing and filing and editing whatever, wherever you were. I find that, that stimulating. Um, and I tend to write every day not because I'm remarkably self-disciplined, but it's more because I'm kind of addicted to it. It's like being a jogger or something. If I don't have my daily writing exercise, I don't feel quite right. Um, I don't do word counts. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some writers, you know, will say, I'm going to write 2,000 words a day and I don't get up from my desk until I've done it. It's because I'm... um, I'm much more of an unplanned writer. Like you, I don't have it all plotted out in advance. So inevitably there's days where I get to points where I can't work out really what's happening or I've run into a problem like the killer's in two places at the same time or something like that. So I can't start writing until I've kind of worked my way through that mentally. Um, And often, you know, in the afternoon, I typically write in the morning and then in the afternoons I might, do some exercise or, you know, it's housework or cooking dinner or whatever it is. But as the year goes on, I'm thinking while I'm doing those things, it's almost like I'm getting captured by the book. So it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I am really think, thinking about the book and where it's going and what's happening, where it's going next. You know, sometimes, it's, you know, I get so involved in it. You know, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have a new idea that's somehow crept into my head while I've been sleeping. It's actually a, um, I find it very addictive and I find it really rewarding when it comes together. So it's a pain, yeah. it's a pain in the neck sometimes when it isn't. Yeah, you, you do seem like a writer that really enjoys the craft because I know, you know, a lot of people, it's very much sort of a love-hate relationship and obviously there's always a, a tricky moment in no matter what book you're writing where, you know, you have to kind of figure things out and it can feel a little bit like an impossible mission but I think that joy of writing that you feel kind of comes through in the tone of your books you know regardless of them being crime they've they've got that light and shade that we've referred to before which um yeah I think makes them like real fun kind of like a you know like a crime caper kind of element which I think gives you that really distinct voice in crime fiction yeah well I you're absolutely right I I really enjoy it I I I love doing it it's, I don't know, it's a, it's a bit like living the dream, I guess, mm. you know, being able to, to just write books. And and I think because I have fun, that shines through. And I do, yeah. even the um, even the editing process that can go for months and it's by that stage it's pretty much all about the head and yeah. not much about the heart. And I know some authors find that bit a real chore and sometimes a bit confronting. You know, people have... Mm you know, sweated blood and tears for years to form this manuscript and they've got an editor saying, oh, I'm not sure that bit works or that bit works. Yeah. Um, I actually have, it's not always the most fun, but it's so essential. Yeah. And, you know, you and I, Sarah, we work with some of the best editors out there. So you'd have to be mad not to listen to them, right? Yeah, very, very lucky that they get first look and help um shape the stories into into ultimately better better sort of stories altogether. Um, we're running close-ish to time, but I did want to ask you, what is what is Martin Scarson up to? Well, as I say, he's got a couple of little cameos in Treasure and Dirt and in yep. The Tilt. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will, I, I think inevitably I'll write another Martin Mandy book. It's, it's very easy to think up the kind of crime stories and a journalist is actually a really good protagonist because you can stick your nose in. It's interesting I've got a, a journalist kind of protagonist in the house, mate. So, yes. so you know, that they don't. there's some limitations. You can't arrest people. You can't get search warrants. You don't have immediate access to sort of forensic evidence. But in other ways, you can have a bit more fun with yes. journalists. They can be much more... 
they're not so constrained by the law, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, so the thing up the crime stories is easy. It's that emotional story. Yes. It's there, in the, it's there in the first three books, this emotional journey for Martin and Maddie. So I don't think I could, I didn't think I could write a book where they were just these mechanistic kind of totally objective investigators. So need to develop a plot where, where as well as all the external crime stories, there's a personal story where they've got skin in the game. But I've got a few ideas there. So, look, I think it's inevitable. We'll, you know, I'll come back to them sooner or later. Yeah, you kind of, um, once you started a series, you, you do have to be mindful of like how far you can push certain characters before it starts to become a little bit unrealistic and if they're not that kind of Jack Reacher, Teflon person, yeah, yeah you have to kind of really work out how, how far that stretch can go and, and sort of sometimes resting them, I think, gives you that perspective, which is obviously kind of what you've done with, with Martin and Mandy. Um, and so that's not what you're working on right now, though? You, are you working on anything in particular or just kind of plotting out some ideas? Um, look, because I've been doing a book a year, um, it's pretty important to get cracking as soon as I can on the next one. Yeah. And plus I get really anxious just before the books come out. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have my head already head, yeah. moving on to another space. And what's, when I wrote uh, Treasure and Dirt, I thought it was going to be a standalone. But Nell and Ivan got under my skin. I wanted to know more about them. So, um, so the tilt, you know, Nell, Nell is very much the dominant character of the two. Ivan is yeah. in the book, but he's not a point of view character. But I'm thinking the next book is going to be an Ivan and Nell book, but probably with a bit more emphasis on Ivan. Ah, oh, interesting. Um, well, I don't think there was any need for you to be anxious about the tilt being launched into the world. It is such an amazing read. It's like all of your books. It's it's big, it's chunky, you can sink right in, you can really get swept away, you know, with the characters but also with the story. So, yeah, thanks so much for writing it and I'm sure everyone is is really pumped about whatever it is that you do next. Um our time is up for today. Um, hopefully you've really enjoyed the discussion that we've had. Um, you can get a copy of Chris's book, uh, The Tilt, uh, and also my book, The Housemate, uh, right now from booktopia.com.au. And, um, yeah, please make sure you make the most of the Booktoberfest celebration. Um, thanks so much for watching, everybody, and hopefully see you next time. Thanks. Have a great day.